Good morning to everyone who's joining us. Um, I see there are people still joining us, so we'll just give people a minute to, to join. Yeah, morning folks, all very welcome. morning everyone there's a few more people that have just joined so we're just waiting um another minute just to let people join in Okay, great. Um, I think we have everyone uh, now. So welcome everyone to LIA's MCQ exam study tips webinar. We're delighted to have so many of you join us this morning. Hopefully you will find this um, useful in the preparation to your upcoming exams. Uh, my name is Eva Lavin. I'm the education manager in LIA and I'm joined here today by our subject matter expert, Brian Johnston. Thanks, Eva. Good morning, everybody. Very welcome. So I suppose um, just let you know that this session really is relevant to anyone who is sitting um, an MCQ or multiple choice exam. And that consists of anyone who is sitting QFA loans, QFA pensions, QFA investment, QFA regulation, QFA life assurance, as well as credit union practices, credit union governance and risk, and our DC pension scheme trustee principles and practices modules, as well as pensions fundamentals. So you're all really welcome um, today. This webinar um, will be approximately um, 20 to 25 minutes. And what we'll cover during that time is the study resources that are available to you, study technique, exam technique, looking at some sample questions and how to approach those questions. And then we'll have um, a short Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions and um, we'll answer them then, you should see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions in relation to um, your studying or any questions that you might have as we go along, please feel free to pop them in there. So we'll kick off with study resources. Um, so there is a lot of study resources available um, to you in your, um, your LIA. We'd really encourage you um, to log into your LIA to actually access your study resources because there's a great um, a range of, of learning supports available to you that will really help with your preparation um, for your exam. Um, in terms of, I suppose, um, the, the textbook, um, Brian, I suppose, would you agree that the textbook really is the primary um, resource available to students? Yeah, uh, thanks, Eva, and good morning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, everything, ultimately, your exam will come from the textbook. Really, in a way, everything else is there, I suppose, to support the textbook. So it's great to have all, we'll, talk, we'll chat about some of the resources in a second, but really everything does come from the textbook. So ultimately at some stage, you can watch all the videos and you know read all the, the, the notes and all that, but you do, the textbook is where the exam comes from. And that's so important. And I suppose, as Aoife says, then, the supports them, you know, things like um, lectures on demand and so forth. So myself and the other lectures, what we try to do is really, is to, you know, in some ways it's to translate the textbook for you. So it helps you with your understanding of that then as well. But it's really in a way sort of like putting a skeleton on something. The devil is in the detail. So it's just so important, Eve, as you say, uh, to, 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 to actually to, uh, to look at the textbook. Um, you know, there's other things there. We'll mention things like 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 study buddies and so forth. So you you, yeah. you have a study buddy uh, that that sort of sets out, you know, the outline of the exam, the number of hours that are required, and so forth, uh, which is really really useful. Um, the other thing it does is, and I th I think we have a slide on this a little bit later on, but it, it it sets out the exam chapter weightings, how many questions you can expect from each chapter, and that can be very very important. And then there's there's various tips and so forth. Um. There's the LIA also provide revision lectures. So, so, so these would be one day lectures um, that 
I think typically the three or four weeks before the exam, Eva, would that, would that be fair to say? But yeah, three exactly. Yeah, three, three or four weeks before the exam. Yeah, one day revision lecture. Yeah. And like, again, so what, what these are designed to do, they're there to help you. So usually what the, what the lecturers do, they'll go over the probably the bigger chapters, the more difficult areas, they'll go over some of the questions. But it's a fantastic chance for you as well, then, you know, to, to ask questions and to, and to actually get involved. So really, really encourage uh, people to, to join up for those. And of course, you know, I think they're normally on a Saturday or Sunday, uh, typically 10 until 3 or 10 until 4 or whatever like that. But it's a, it's a great chance you know, to, to really to study well and to study with a group, but you also hear other students' questions that you mightn't think of yourself. And, and, and I, I always find that really useful. And God knows, sometimes we do get, we do get questions that we hadn't thought about uh, ourselves before. Um, the exam body then, of course, is uh, where you get a sample of the questions. So you can look at this bank of questions. So there's, there's two sample papers. And these are indicative of the type of questions that you can expect in the exam. For, for obviously, for for, uh, for for your particular uh, for, for your particular subject. And again, it is so important to think that you practice those. Yeah, and something I suppose, Brian, that we get asked a lot from students is, you know, are there more, um, you know questions available and I suppose like the answer really is is no like the sample questions that are available in your exam buddy and um, they're the only sample questions that are available to you but if you are looking for you know to practice extra questions there are questions you know at the end of each chapter in the textbook also in your lecture slides that are available in your study resources generally there's two or three um, sample questions as well at the end of each chapter in those slides that you can kind of look at as a little bit if you wanted extra extra practice outside of the sample papers. Absolutely, Re a really good point. And sometimes I think it's, it's, it's a really good idea, Eva, you know, to, to, to look at the alternatives sometimes, to think about the alternatives, you know, well, what's this in relation? I know it's not the answer, but it, it's it's usually something else to, uh, to, to do with that chapter or manual as well. And it's, all, it's, it's always very helpful to look at those. Yeah, exactly, Brian, yeah. And then we have some more than study resources as well. Yeah, as I said, the, the, the pre-recorded lectures on demand, they again, they will go through, as I said, it's really, it's a, from my point of view, I certainly see it, I think the other lectures do, it's it's a way to help you, it's it's a, it's a very useful way to sort of to translate the book, and I know people use these differently, sometimes people will use these as an introduction to the chapter, so yeah, just get, just get a broad overview, and of course, the great thing about it is they're pre-recorded, you can look at them, you can listen to them while you're moving around, and so forth as well, and it, it, it'll give you an introduction to it, so then hopefully when you read the manual, it'll actually make a lot of sense. Other people, of course, use it then for, for revision, so they've already read the stuff, and again, they can go through it that way as well, and it's, it's um, again, people find these very, very useful. The, the tax tables then are sort of, it's, it's, this is essential information that complements whatever course you're studying so the sort of general tax tables and there's obviously there's, there's pension figures and so forth and these are very very useful but if i'm right in saying these are not given in the exams it's not right so, so these are really there to, to help people other resources are available in the exam but not these yeah. full tax tables yeah exactly brian so that's actually a question we do get the tax tables aren't available um with on the exam day what is available for some modules if it's applicable are exam tables and if you have exam tables um, are required for your module, you can actually find them in the exam body with, with the sample papers if, if you're looking for them. But the tax tables um, are just really there to help you with your preparation. Good stuff. And in a way, we're saving the best on the last. Here's a piece of gold as well, the poorly performing areas. So what the LIA do is they produce a list of where a lot of people went wrong on, on a past exam. Um, and it is one of the most useful things, and it's a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic way to study. Um, do we have it? Do we yeah, have a... Brian, I was going to say, we have a sample one here. A, a sample one there. Yeah. So, so look, th th there's, there's one from, uh, from the regulations module. And really what it does is, so this means, you can see the very first one there, conduct of business rules, 1.2.4. So this is where in the last examination that quite a few people actually went wrong on this. So what does it do? It directs you to that reference in the chapter 1.2.4, which is about conduct of business rules. So I just think it's so important that you go in and that you look at that and you study that. So it won't give you the question, but it gives you the reference uh, in, in your manual where it is. 2.3.1 types of investment intermediaries and so forth, minimum competency code. And I always think this is a great way 
you know, to study. So if you want to knock off in half an hour, you know, a half an hour, an hour, I'll pick out six of these or five of these and make sure that I really know them. Because you do know that these questions are in the question bank. I don't think you're necessarily guaranteed to get them always, but, but the chances are that you'll actually get a good few of them. And, and, and they're produced for all the modules, Eva, as well, aren't they? For, they are, I know that's yeah. just a regulation one. Yeah, and they're, and they're all available again um, as part of your um, learning, learning support that's available in your study resources. Yeah, and of course, the other, I think it's worth mentioning as well, if, if there's one question on something, there's often two questions on it as well, the same subject, and it's maybe just asked slightly differently. So really, really worthwhile and gold. And the other thing, of course, is it does make study a little bit easier. Very often, if you're just reading your manual, maybe particular, particularly regulation, after a little while, things just start to go over your head and whatever like that. But now you're studying with focus. Exactly. You're looking at something, you know, there's a question on 1.2.4. So, so you're looking for all the angles on it. Exactly, Brian. And just another thing that you actually you touched on earlier was chapter weighting. And I know for me, I found this incredibly useful as part of my study um, and my preparation for the exam. And you probably know, Brian, that it's probably a resource that's not utilised enough by students. Yeah, very, very true, Eva. So I, I suppose two things. First of all, the chapter weighting will give you it, what it gives you. It gives you the minimum number of questions you can expect per chapter and the maximum number. So in this particular example, now, obviously, every module is different. So, you know, other modules look, will look very differently. But in this one, you can see the uh, chapter one there would be a relatively small chapter. And chapter two is, 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 is an actual is a bigger chapter. So, you know, therefore, I can't see the exact figures, but let's say, you know, there's between five and 10 in chapter one. But there's between, let's say, whatever, 20 and 25 in chapter two. Now, it normally reflects the size of the chapter as well. I think I, I think it would actually be fair to say that. But the other thing in conjunction with that is that questions also come up in chapter order in your exam. And I think that can make a huge difference. So if, if you think, you know, you think, well, where am I now? I'm on chapter two or chapter three or whatever like that. For, for argument's sake, let's say you're doing the investments one. And if you're on chapter four, which is all about deposits, if there's a question about tax, chances are you know, the answer is dirt. And I'm not saying definitively it is, but the chances are because, you know, with your deposit account, it's all about dirt. So sometimes that they can be little eliminators that you, that, that you can make really, really work for yourself. And I'd also say as well, sometimes people say, oh, I'll just concentrate on the bigger chapters. Never neglect the smaller chapters either. Very often you'll get with the smaller chapters and some, sometimes the chapters can be quite small, but sometimes you just get a fairly straightforward question because it is a small one as well. And once you've read it, you're actually fine there as well. So yeah. chapter weighting is really, really important. Yeah, and, ju and just to remember as well, you know, all, all of these resources are available in your study resources when you log into your LIA. So really important to log into your LIA and actually go, go through study resources that are available. They're available 24 seven um, as well. So if you have any late night studiers or early morning studiers, you know, they're available all the time for you on the go as well. So they're really useful and um, really, really important as part of your preparation. Great. Yeah. I suppose, um, Brian, first exams now are coming up very shortly for students. Um, and I suppose in terms of this, um, what really should students be thinking of, Brian, in terms of the preparation for their study? Well, I guess, you know, this, <laughs> you know, if, if you haven't started 10, week, 10 weeks ago, somebody said the best time to start is now, isn't it? Like, you know, so I would say make a plan. And and map it, and sort of map out how many days you're going to study and the hours you're going to do. The chances are, if you write it down and map it out, you'll do it. I often find like, you know, I'll do it all day Saturday, Saturday comes and it's a beautiful day or something like that. And it doesn't, and it doesn't actually happen. But I think if you can map it out, you know, if you're a detailed person, great, put a lot of detail. In. If you're not, put, you know, just plan it out. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Personally, I think, Early mornings work quite well. They work, they work well for me because we tend to be a little bit fresher. Most of you are probably working, so you're probably tired after the day as well, and, and it can be more difficult. I also think with these, sometimes smaller blocks works very well. A full day study, again, depending on your own style, but a full day study can be, can be quite cumbersome. And we tend to remember better in sort of smaller blocks. You know, if you study in blocks, typically 45 to 60 minutes, your recall tends to be better. And you can work very, very hard on that. OK, you need to have concentration then as well. So don't forget, really important. And I think we covered this in a second, but it's repetition and testing yourself is how we remember. So repetition, 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 but also testing yourself. 
I know many students say to me, oh yeah, Brian is grand. Like, you know, when, when you're chatting or when I'm reading the book, I think I understand it. But then as soon as I'm asked a question, God, I'm stumped, like, you know? So, so this is, as Aoife says, using those questions, but also use those questions again to, to link into, you know, uh, your book and test yourself and use the questions at the back of the chapter. So if you can, you know, plan, block off time. Again, depending on your circumstances, usually you don't want to be disturbed. I, I know that can be difficult for some people, but if you can find a nice place, you know, that's that's your area. And let other people know that you're studying as well, you know, that you'd expect, you know, that you that you really appreciate a little bit of quiet time or whatever to do that. Um, reward yourself. I think that's a great idea, you know. So look, I'm going to study for an hour and a half and I'm going to have a, a cookie and a, and a coffee or whatever at the end of it, or I'll, I'll, I'll actually treat myself to something. Here's one thing that works really well. And again, it depends on your circumstances, but having a study group. If you can form an alliance with a colleague, if you're working with somebody or a friend or whatever that who know you're doing the same thing, I think it is great to have a study group. It's a little bit like going to the gym, you know, or going for a run, whatever you like that. If you arrange to meet somebody, the chances are you'll do it. Whereas if you don't, ah, I'm not really in the form today. But if you form a study group, you can bounce ideas off each other. You can make a little bit of fun of it. And certainly, you know, when we've done in-house stuff and all that, when people form study groups, it works really, really well. And of course, great backup to yourself. And I'll pass it back to Eva then, yeah. is all the backup of the LIA, everything they do for you. It's 24 hours a day and people are there to, are there to support you as well. Yeah, exactly. And like, um, you know, we are here to support, you know, you on your study journey. So, you know, please contact us by email, phone or live chat. If you do have any questions um, for us, we're always more than happy um, to help you um, on your kind of study journey. So that option is, is always there for students as well. Yeah, and I know if it just to say as well, sometimes, yeah. you know, there might be a technical, I, I often get technical questions from the LA and I'm sure the other lecturers do as well. You know, Brian, I don't really get this question. Why is it this answer? Why is it that answer or whatever like that? So there's, there's lots of support there to you like, uh, like that as well. Exactly. And I suppose, Brian, like in terms of like um, students approach to study, I know I would have found it really useful to make my own notes when I was studying. Do you have any tips for students on, I suppose, their approach to study? Yeah, a, a couple of things. Obviously, as I say, the way I like to study now, it's different for different people, but I, I like to get an overview first, the big picture. And sometimes with some of these, they, they can be quite complex. You know, so, so some of the things that there's quite a bit of technical detail. But I think if you go back to basics, get the overview first of all. Now you understand, you know, what, what, what you're actually reading about. And some of the rest then is just detail. So certainly, obviously, getting the overview, and you can do that maybe from, from, from the lectures or, or just reading the chapter. I'd also say, look at other areas sometimes just to get a different view, you know, Google something or whatever like that. Then, then you're down to actually reading the manual and studying the manual and so forth. Take notes. When you write something down, it's amazing the way it sticks in your mind. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with what we call mind mapping or spider diagrams and so forth, but it really suits many of the LIA courses. So this is where you have like a central idea and then you have ideas coming out of that rather than just linear stuff. And it's amazing the way the brain works then because the brain is creative, whatever like that. It tends to remember these things. So here's a little one we did a while ago for Mifid and whatever like that. And you can see, you can see our good friend there, Homer Simpson, think, think, thinking about some of the stuff. But now you're looking at diagrams and so forth and you're starting to link things. Mind you, mind mapping is great for other things too. Like, you know, like study, holidays, your finances, lots of things, but it really, really works well for this as well. And the more creative you are, the better. And to be honest, it also makes a little bit of fun of study then as well. You know, it's, it's, it allows you to enjoy it as well. Writing stuff down, you know, and, and even underlying stuff in the books can, can in, in your manuals can really, really help you as well. Um, so yeah, so just, just in terms of that, like, you know, as I say, short, short spaces of study and test yourself we remember better, you know? So as time goes on, if you've listened to a lecture or whatever like that, if you leave it for a couple of weeks, you'll have forgotten everything the person said. But if you go over it and over it and over it, revision, 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 okay? And it really does work. It really, really works well. So constant revision, go over the stuff, move on, revise it and test yourself as well. Use the questions. It's really, really important. I think that can work well. Another thing, and never under, un, underestimate this, watch the marking in the exam. And you can be, you know, you, you, you can be quite strategic here. 
with the multiple choice examinations, if you get something right, you get three marks. If you get something wrong, it is minus one. And the great one then is, if you don't attempt it or if you don't know it, you get zero. So strategy can play a very important role. Just to give you an idea of some of the markings. So 100 by three, 300, you know, so there's 100 questions, 300, 100% happy days. And that does happen, Aoife, doesn't it? It's, 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 people do get 100% as well, yeah, in, in yeah, some, for the exams, yeah. which is great. So, so it is possible to get 100%, probably more so than a written exam ever as well, isn't it? You get the full 100% exactly. on that as well. So happy days. But let's say you get 80 right. So if you get 80 questions right, 80 by three is 240. Now, if you answer none of the others, you're well into the 80% there. That's 20 questions that you can have ignored. Okay, or you weren't, you weren't sure of. And even if you did attempt all those other 20s, you can see it, it does bring you back a little bit, but you're still well over the line. If you get 60 questions right, you're still well over the line. So don't forget the pass mark out of 300 is 120. You only need to, you need to get to 120 to pass. So 60 by three is 180. Again, you're well over the 50% on that. And again, you can see by answering other questions, it brings you back. And again, if you answered all 40 wrong, it would bring you back. But sometimes it can be very judicious not to answer questions as well, if you're not sure about it. I haven't a clue. We look at one or two questions in a second, A, B, C, or D, got to have a clue. Leave it. 55, you get 55 right, it's sort of the bottom, you know, it, it allows you to get all the others wrong. I'm not saying you should do all the others, but, but 55. And then you can see if somebody answers 50 right, but they answer, they answer too many questions, it brings them back. You can see the way by answering too many questions sometimes, it does actually bring you back. Okay, so really important, top them up as you go along or towards the end or whatever like that. I'm really happy now, I've got, I've got, I feel I've done 60, 65 right, boom, I'm really happy. And then maybe go back over the ones that you weren't sure of and leave the ones then at that stage. Well, I definitely don't know those. And I think that's a really good point, Brian, because like a lot of students even might be joining us here today, it might be their very first time to sit um, a multiple choice exam. And it really is important to know how the exam is corrected because as we've seen, um, the negative marking has a big impact on your overall score. And we'd always, you know, um, say to students, if really, if you don't know the answer to a question, select option E, I don't know, and at least you're not being penalised um, yeah. for, so you're not, you're not getting impacted by the negative marking. So it's really kind of important to know that. Um, in terms of exam technique, and I know, Brian, you talk a lot to your students um, about exam technique and the importance of exam technique as well. Do you want to take us through um, some of these points? Yeah, I, I suppose uh, probably the biggest point, uh, Aoife, is, mm. and again, all past students say to me, you know, to me, if you ever ask them, you know, what would you say to, to, to new students? And the answer always is read the question. It, mm. it might sound so obvious, but read the question. It is so easy to make. And look, I still do it myself all the time. It is so easy to make a mistake on that. And I think that's very often where people feel a bit frustrated. You know, they lose a few marks because they haven't read the question. As opposed to you get a really tough question. Well, that's fair enough, you don't know it. But when you do know them, you just haven't read it right, that, that's it. So read the question. Another area that a lot of questions are taken from are the textbook examples. So always make sure you read the examples in the book. Very often, a multiple choice question would be lifted nearly directly from it, which is really, really important. Yeah, I think that's an important point as well as pacing yourself. If you have 100 questions. I think people often say, oh God, you start to feel a bit tired in the second 50, you know, it's certainly the last 30, you know. So, so, so sort of pace yourself and, you know, uh, have a glass of water available and so forth. Um, do, them, do the ones you know, first of all, I'd say, you know, that you're pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right, do those. You can mark the other ones and you can mark the other ones and you can flag them as well, Eve. I'm, I'm right in saying that you can yeah, flag exactly. them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so with the online yeah. exams, you can 22 and 23. Yeah. Um, so, and you can go back. So go do those, go over them, tot them up and then go back again, go back, go back over the ones that you're not sure of. And the other thing sometimes is, sometimes one question will prompt an answer from another question. You know, so question 63 might, might help you with questions, you know, 54 or something like that. It, it'll give you the answer or actually in the, in the answer, it, it'll actually prompt it. So I'll, I'll always use that then as well. Be careful of the not questions, which the following is not. Just, just easy to make a mistake on, I find. 
for calculations. So there will be, you know, for, for some of the modules, there are calculations. Um, if you're not good at maths, which I know is a, a lot of people, including myself, a simple calculator. Okay, just just a simple calculator is, is so important. If you're good at maths, then, then, then you're actually fine. And I think I'm right in saying, Aoife, you know, the most that ever happens, and this would be a hard question, there, there may be three steps in it. Exactly, yeah. There typically, there's only one, but, yeah. but there, may, there may be up to three, but typically there's only one. And sometimes questions look like calculations, but they're not really, they just use figures. They're, they're more knowledge, though, than calculations. Yeah. And the other thing that's worthwhile doing sometimes is um, just have a look at the question. You know, and even figure it out, think about it, because because sometimes you can actually work out the answer without even using a calculator. But again, by process of elimination, which is, of course, another really, really important one, eliminating. And that really helps people. So you're reading the question. It's definitely not one. It can't be number one. That's that's not in it. It's definitely not number. It's you know, so it's definitely not D. Now you're down to a 50 50 and it does. It feels psychologically an awful lot better as well. Sometimes, you know, you can even, by eliminating answers, you can actually get to the right answer as well. These Roman numeral questions, then, as we call them as well, you know, so this is where they ask you to, is it one, is it two, is it one and two and three and so forth? Again, take your time with those. And sometimes, and I think of a little example on this, you know, if you know one of the answers, sometimes that can help you to eliminate the others or to include them or whatever as well. So that's another little technique there. Yeah. Um, and as we said, look, if you don't know the answer, Leave it, move on and come back to us, you know, after, when you're doing your sum up then as well. I think that's a really good point, Brian, because um, a lot of feedback we get from students as well is that they, they just didn't read the question. And when, pe when students are under pressure in an exam environment, you know, it's, it's a lot harder. So it's really important, as you said, to read the question. And, and I said, if, if it's something that you're unsure of, come back to us, you know, with maybe with fresh eyes, you know, move on and come back to us. Actually, you know, that's just thinking about that. I mean, that's such a good question. You know, when we're all sitting at home watching who wants to be a millionaire, it's dead easy, isn't it? And it's a bit like that with your practice paper. It's dead easy. You're not on pressure or whatever like that. But all of a sudden in the exam, you're in the hot seat. And actually, you know, I often experience that myself. You know, when people ask me questions, if you're lecturing or if you're, if you're doing something like this, you're, you're under more pressure. And all of a sudden, it, it is more difficult. It really, really is more difficult. So read the question and take your time. Exactly. Uh, so here we go. What, what do you see there, folks? Here's, here's the fun part of the day. <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> so I can see optical at the moment. What yeah. do you see, Eva? I can see, I can see optical. It's playing, my mind is playing tricks on me there. <laughs> And I'm sure some of you can see illusion then as well. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a little bit of fun, but it, it brings us to the questions really like, you know, reading the question. It's so easy to, it's so easy to misread the questions. Have we got a few examples yeah, exactly. of questions, uh, Eva? Yeah, so I was going to say up next, have a few samples. We might go through some of these now. Okay, so look, you know, th these are just one or two that we picked out, whatever like that, that, you know, that we often come across. That it's, Here's one that is just so easy to make a mistake on. People are familiar with fitness and probity. So here was a question. Okay. Um, the central bank's fitness and probity stands require in relation to probity that the individual be competent and capable, honest and ethical, uh, and financially sound. And to be honest, and I put myself in this camp as well. Oh, yeah, fitness and probability, that's it. Competent, capable, honest, and ethical, financially sound. Happy days, boom. One, two, and three. Well, hang on, Brian, that wasn't the question. The question was, the central bank's fitness and probity require in relation to, oh, no, just probity only. <laughs> Which is, the fitness bit is the competent and capable bit. So the probity bit is you're honest and ethical and you're financially sound. So that, that was a tricky question, as Chris yeah. Tarrant would say. And again, and it comes back to reading the question, doesn't it? It comes back to reading the it comes back to reading the question, yeah. Because we see a thing, I think what we we see a thing there, fitness and probity, yeah, requires, oh yeah, competent capable, yep, that's it. But now it was only in relation to probability. And of course, the alternative, the other question to that then was the central bank fitness and probability standards. And here's the thing as well, where you get one question you will very often just get a small variation, but it'll give you another question then as well. So your alternative to that question is, the central bank's fitness and probability standards require in relation to fitness that the person be competent and capable and so forth. So read the question. 
Okay. Here's another sort of sample again for, 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 for people doing pensions where I, I find a lot of people again go wrong. And look, it's even highlighted. The earliest normal retirement age, which an employer pension scheme can use is 50, 55, 60, or 55. Now, anybody doing pensions will know you, you can go on early retirement from age 50. But again, that wasn't the question. So the question is, what's the earliest normal retirement age, which of course is 60. Okay. Now, I know as we point these out, sometimes, yes, it, it seems obvious, but as, as Aoife says, when you're in the heat of battle there in an exam, things don't always seem that, that easy either. So take your time. Okay, here's what I'm still struggling on sometimes. Um, so sometimes I think these are sometimes, what is the maximum cooling off period which applies for credit union loan, which is not a mortgage? So is it 10 days, 14 days, 15 days, or 13 days? Now look, some of these you intrinsically know. You know, if you're working with these sometimes, are you just, some of these things sometimes you know better than others. But if you don't, I often feel these are the easy ones. God, is it 10 days or is it 14 days or is it 15 days? These are the ones that are often, I think, it's sometimes it's hard to eliminate stuff on this. Okay, now if you're sure, obviously, absolutely fine. You know, the, the answer is, I hope I'm right, it's 14 days. Um, but if you're not sure, sometimes I think they're good ones to leave because, you know, it could sort of be any of those. And they're often the ones you sort of kick yourself on. It's, it's a bit like the quiz program, you know, was it 18, 92, 93, 94? Pfft, who knows? So anyway, just be, just be careful of those. Uh, again, sometimes, working out the question. So here's, here's a sample question. A policy which provides a fixed amount of life cover for life in return for a fixed premium is called which type of policy? So golly, I'm not 100% sure on this. So decreasing term assurance. Hmm. Now, what's wrong with that maybe? So here, here's things that you can eliminate as opposed to the last one maybe. So a decreasing term figure, hmm, that doesn't sound right. So that's it's not a fixed amount of cover, it's decreasing. Okay. A unit linked whole of life policy. Okay, so that is for life. Okay, but remember your man saying something about, you know, these unit linked policies, yeah, they're reviewable, so the premium could be reviewable. So maybe that's not a fixed premium, so that's gone. Okay, reviewable sounds like it's reviewable, doesn't it? So maybe something can change the premium, whatever like that. Guaranteed whole of life, well, that seems to fit the bill. It sounds like a life, whatever like that, and it's guaranteed. So if you're not sure, sometimes you can eliminate just to, just to help you to get there as well. Okay, so use the other answers to help you as well. Here's an example then of the Roman numeral question. So this is, is it one, two, is it one and two and three and so forth? Um, so the question is, the central bank has determined that a life insurance company systematically overcharged a large number of its unit link policyholders because of an incorrect method of calculating unit prices. The central bank can direct the life insurance company to pay the relevant policyholders the amount overcharged, the interest on the amount overcharged, and additional compensation for worry and distress. So again, you know, if you think number one has to be in the answer, so um, one is in A, B, and D. So if you're happy that one is in the answer, well, C is gone automatically. Okay. Interest on the amount overcharged. Okay, so that's two there. So again, you can do that. Now, here's the one in this case. Additional compensation for worry and distress. So you're not 100% sure of the question, but you know that you can't get any compensation for distress and worry, but you're not sure about is, 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 is can you get interest, let's say. But you definitely know not, you can't get any combo for worry and distress. So three is in D, three is in C, and three is in B then as well. So really that eliminates it then it makes it safe for yourself. I'm not saying you always know that, but sometimes you can get to the right answer by elimination or using something you know is definitely in or definitely, or definitely not in. Okay, so it is one and two there. Three can't be in it. So three is gone from B, C and D. And we have a long one now. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> 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 exactly. And I think in fairness, you know, so yeah. the, look, a, a very good, uh, just a, one or two other points that, that strike me as well. There's, there's always plenty of what I call low hanging fruit. There's always plenty of fairly straightforward questions. The ones you've, the, the ones you've, the ones you've read the manual, you know, that, that you're fairly happy with. And they often tend to be quite short as well. And there's a few longer ones. So sometimes you might get a couple of longer ones like this. So here's an example of a longer one. Abigail received 
uh, credit from a finance company. After thinking about it over the next three days, she decides she doesn't want to proceed with the arrangement, which the following statements relation to Abigail revoking the content is most accurate. So once again, I think this will take a bit, you know, this will take a little bit of um, concentration. Overall, you have 100 questions and you have two hours to do it. So it's roughly 1.2 minutes per question. Maybe allow a little bit of time to start in the end and so forth to, uh, to, uh, to go over your stuff. But, but some of the questions will actually be fairly straightforward. Okay, some, some of them will actually be very straight and they won't take more, a little bit more time. So this is, this is an example here of one that you have to read through and so forth. A couple of little pointers I'd say on some of these. As you read through these, Okay, and I'm not picking the right or the wrong answer here, whatever like that for the moment. Okay, let's say A, it could be done without reason within 14 days. Once Abigail notifies the credit provider in writing, boom, 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 no later than five days. I don't think that's right, you know, but I'm not sure yet. So maybe a little question mark there, you know, or, or something, you know, to give, you don't think that's right. Or if you thought it was right, maybe, a, a, you know, a little tick beside it to think, yeah, that could be it. B, if Abigail notifies the credit provider within 30 calendar days uh, from the date she received the conditions, repays the capital and interest within 14 calendar days. So that's again messing around with it again. You might think that's right or wrong. Once Abigail has a valid reason within 14 calendar days from the credit agreement concluded, she repays the capital and the interest immediately. Mm. Or if within 14 calendar days of the date she received the terms and conditions of the agreement, she notifies the credit provider in writing and repays the capital and the interest accrued within 30 days. Yeah, things seem to remember something about like that, you know, that that could be right. So once again, if my, we were chatting about this, this could be a good one to go, you know, to come back, to get, you know, to, to let it sit for a little while and maybe to come back and, and to actually look at it then again. OK, but in fairness, you will receive it, I, plenty of compensation for shorter questions for the for the few longer ones that you get then as well. Mm. Okay. And, that's, and that's a good point, Brian, like the, the papers are balanced, you know, we're, we're definitely not trying to catch students out. And um, as I said, there are questions that you'll get through an awful lot quicker. And then there's questions that just might involve a little bit more thinking. Um, and they are the ones that I suppose when you have the time in your exam, to take that time to look at them and, and read the question. Yeah, so I mean, if, if, if you contrast, you know, that question, your next question might be just, you know, a one liner, which of the following, you know, is boom, boom, boom. So there's a much easier earned three marks than this one, you know, so this, this one you really earn your three marks on. And again, judiciously, don't forget the number of questions you have to get, you know, so this may be one, God, I'm not sure they all look a little bit the same, rather than guessing it, because in a way, they all do look a little bit the same here. And so unless you're sure, but maybe it's a good one to, I don't know, at some stages. Exactly. Thanks, Brian. So after all that, <laughs> can you spot the mistake on this one? This one took me now a while to, <laughs> to guess. <laughs> Which module is this taken from, Eva? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we might leave that one, which was... Yeah. Which, you know, People can have a, have, a, have a little think about that one. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting again. But as you said, Brian, it really, it does all kind of fall back to taking the time, reading, reading the question, you know, because it's the smallest little detail can, can throw people um, in, in the exam. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so that, that brings us to the to the end of um, the MCQ study tips webinar and um, to say thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. Really hope that you found that useful and um, that you, that really helped with the, your preparation. And thank you to Brian as well for for joining me. I'm going to check if we have any questions. Um, and we can kind of go through those for the next few minutes. But just to note as well that, you know, please feel free to contact us um, in LIA by email, phone or live chat on our website. And the details are on screen there. We're always more than happy and um, happy to talk to you or help you with, with your studies. So I'm just going to open any questions here. Um, so one person is saying, can I preview what an online exam will look like? So what we kind of say to students is um, we, there's a, 
an online exam user guide available in your study resources and within that you'll find that there is actually videos showing you the online exam process the actual initial setup and what an actual exam looks like so we really encourage everyone especially if it's your first time sitting an online exam to review that document that goes through what you can you know have on your desk on the day of the exam what you're not permitted to have on your desk and um, so it'll really give you a good indication um, as to your the, the whole online exam um, format and what to expect on the day of the exam um, does it matter if you leave the question blank or must you tick E? So if you leave the question blank, um, you will be marked as if you marked it as E. I don't know. So we often get students that are kind of a little bit worried about that, but that is, um, it'll just be marked as E, consider that it'll be E. Um, so then we have, again, what percentage of students pass the exam? and the reset option. So I suppose, Brian, we would have seen this before, like the, the pass rates for exams are, are high. Like they're in, they're in the 80s, like yeah. in, the, in the mid 80s for, for students. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, generally speaking, people do very, very well mm. yeah. on these. Yeah, so that's what we, because students always kind of, that is something that, that students do kind of uh, wonder about, you know, what is the pass rate? But generally the pass rate is very good for, for multiple choice um, exams. Another question, do we get the results straight away? Um, unfortunately not. So the, the results are generally available um, five to six weeks after the exam takes place. And if and the exam um, release dates will be available on the website, but you can also just contact us um, and we'll be able to provide you with that um, information. Eva, I, I just said just the other thing to mention is, yeah. you know, just maybe more from a work point of view, but all these LIA modules, they're really practical. So a lot of people come across this in their work life as well. So there's, there's, there's very little theory in any of the manuals here. It's all really, you know, th th this is the way it is out there. And this is the sort of advice people are looking for. So it's, it's, it's sort of true advice all the time. And, and I know, I know that many of the, many of the manuals are, you know, they're kept for reference manuals in various, you know, yeah. offices around the country. So it, it's really, really practical stuff as well. Yeah. Another question, is the pass rate for all MCQ exams 40%? Yes, they are. It is. So 40% is the is, is, is the is the pass mark for all of our um, MCQ exams. Um, another question, has there been any issues with max for online exams? Um, max are generally um, okay, but I would suggest just if you email us in education at lia.ie, LIA we'll be able to just confirm that for you if you have any kind of concerns about your, your laptop or the device that you're using for your um, online exams. Uh, another question, is the exam based on the current rates introduced in the recent budget? So the questions and the content and the, the rates are based on the, the, the textbook. It's not based on so the, the textbooks are valid for the year, but the textbooks, um, due to the nature of the academic year, would have been updated before the most recent budget. But questions will always be based on the content of the, of the, of the textbook. I think that's a really important point, Eva. That's yeah. a really, really good point. So it's always based on what's your manual, okay? And if there's ever a conflict with what your man, the lecturer, said in the book or in the notes, it's always what's in the manual. Is that okay? That's, you know, yeah. just if that does happen. But it's always what's in the book, yeah. Exactly. And uh, where can I find uh, lecture revision videos? So again, they are available in your study resources. So if you log into your LIA, go into your study resources, you'll find the revision videos there. Again, if you're unsure of where to find them or how to access them, just contact um, LIA and we'll be able to, to guide you in that. Um, let me see if there are any other questions here that we haven't really kind of covered. I think we've covered everything there really in relation to um, the questions and just conscious of and um, the time we're at as well. But if we haven't, um, if we've missed any questions, um, please contact us, you know, in, in LIA. And um, if there's any questions that we've that, that we have um, missed here, we will try and get back to, to everybody um, after after this session. But again, please, please contact us in LIA. I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions and support you.
So thanks again. Thanks, guys.